once again welcome to Ken e-learning in collaboration with Ocean One TV. Here we teach you, we, we do a virtual teaching so that when you are at home, you enjoy being taught in the comfort of your homes. This program is brought to you by Ken e-learning as I said and then Ocean One TV. We need sponsorship. People are calling in for more subjects. We'll be able to do that when we get more sponsors to seek to our financial needs and other needs. So if you are interested in sponsoring this program, you can contact us on the number 0242 885463. The number again, 0242 885463. Six, three. Today, we are treating literary devices in literature and English. For the past three weeks, we've been looking at some literary devices. What students must understand is that there are so many devices that we cannot treat them all. But we are looking at the basic ones, then later on, we will look at how these devices work out in a test, either a poem, a novel, or a drama, to bring out meaning. So we will continue with our literary devices and then later on, we check its usage in a test. What did we say literary devices are? We said they are devices, they are specific techniques which writers use to create tests. They are specific language techniques that writers use to create tests. They use those tests, those devices in their tests to create meaning. It is not for just decorating, but it is to create meaning. We also say that the literary devices are used to convey messages. So through the devices, the writers will give you their messages and then ask you, the critic, ask you, the one appreciating the literary test. Through the literary devices, you are able to analyze what is said, you are able to interpret what is said, and you are also able to bring out meaning in the literary text. For the past week, we've been looking at devices such as simile, metaphor, hyperbole. We looked at alliteration, pan. All these we've looked at in the past weeks. Today, we are going to look at allusion, metonymy, paradox, rhyme, sarcasm, and then imagery. Let's take allusion. Yes, what is an allusion? Allusion is a brief and indirect reference made to a person, a place, or an idea of historical, cultural, literary, or political significance. What do we mean by that? When somebody in his or her writing or in her speech makes use of anything that is said, happened in history, something that happened in the Bible, something that happened in myth, then we say that the person is making a reference. The person is alluding. That is the word. You are alluding to whatever reference you are making in your speech or the text. Now, there are three types of allusions. We have biblical, historical, and mythological. Biblical, historical and mythological. When we talk of biblical allusion, that means that you are making reference to something that happened in the Bible. That is why we call that reference biblical allusion. When you make reference to something that happens in the Bible, then you are making a biblical allusion. For instance, in example one, we have this place, it's like the Garden of Eden. 
We all know the Garden of Eden, the creation story, where we are told God created a beautiful garden and put in Adam and Eve. So if you make reference to Garden of Eden, then we say you are making a biblical allusion. Okay. The second one, Amma is the Yasantua of our time. We all remember Yasantua, the historical queen mother of Egypt. She is said to be brave. So if somebody exhibits some characteristics of Yasantua, then we can see that the person is Yasantua. Then you are making reference to something that happened in history. So we will say that Yasantua of our time is a historical allusion. Now let's go to the third one. The man's love for food is his Ashley's heels. Here, Ashley's is said to be the son of a goddess, a Greek goddess. The mother wanted him to be very strong, so he, she dipped him into a river. Then the mother held Ashley's by the heels and then dipped him into the river because the heels did not get into the river it was his weak point that is the weakest part of his body you can shoot him or you can set an arrow to him but if it gets to his heels he is going to die because that is the part that did not get to the river so here by saying that the man's love for food is his Ashley's heels, you are making use of mythological allusion. Because we are making reference to something that happened in myth, the Greek myth. So you realize that you make reference to the Bible, that is biblical allusion. If you make reference to something that happened in history, then you are making a historical allusion. And then if you make reference to anything that happened in the myth, the Greek myth, the ancient myth, that is mythological allusion. We can also make reference to things that happened in our lives. You can even make reference to things that happened in your personal life that can also be allusion. But remember that the allusion should be something that everybody knows. It is known, not something that will create confusion. When we make reference or use allusion, we bring in other experiences. So that when we talk about the Garden of Eden, you talk of the beauty of the garden, and then you refer it to what you are talking about. So writers use allusion to bring out experiences, they relate experiences that happened later on or that happened earlier on to what is happening in present lives. Now we go on to metonymy. The device is known as metonymy. Metonymy. Metonymy is when a thing or concept is referred to by name of something closely related to it. When you refer to a concept or an idea by referring to something that is closely related to it or something that is characteristics of it, then you are using metonymy. We shouldn't confuse metonymy with synecdoche. We use metonymy when you talk of the associations or the characteristics of something to refer to it. That is metonymy. But synecdoche is when you use parts to represent whole. When you use parts to represent whole, that is synecdoche. So here, this is characteristics. And then with synecdoche, you are using part to represent whole. Now, let's go to our examples. The first example is 
The pen is mightier than the sword. The pen is mightier than the sword. Here, the pen and the sword are used in the form of metonymy. The pen and the sword are used in the form of metonymy. Here, the pen refers to all those that write. So we can say journalist, teachers, and then the sword will be military aggression. The next one is the crown will visit us tomorrow. The crown will visit us tomorrow. Here, the crown is related to royalty. So it can be that we are talking about the king. The queen, the prince, or the princess. So anybody that has the crown as part of that person's habit, then we will say that we are referring to royalty. So the crown will visit us tomorrow here. Can be that the king will visit us tomorrow, the queen will visit us tomorrow, the prince will visit us tomorrow, or the princess will visit us tomorrow. So here, the crown is used as an association of royalty to refer to it. That is metonymy. It is different from synodoky, where you use part of that thing to refer to it. The crown is not part of the queen. It is not part of the body. It is something associated with the Queen, queen, prince, or princess, that is royalty. So here, the crown is used in the form of metonymy in this statement. The next one is, maybe after the protest, Ghana will listen to the students. Maybe students are protesting, they are just demonstrating on issues, and nobody is listening to them. Then the speaker says, maybe after the protest, Ghana will listen to the student. Here, Ghana is used to refer to the government of Ghana. Here, the government of Ghana will listen to the student. So the government of Ghana is used as a metonymy to represent the government of Ghana. Remember that Synodoky is when you use part. For example, if you say that I have so many mouths to feed, here you are using the mouth as part of the human being to refer to the human being. So it is not that 
you are using the mouth as an association. The mouth is part of the human being. However, if you say that, give me a hand. Give me a hand here. Here, hand is used as metonymy, not synonymy. This is synecdoche. And then give me a hand. Here, though hand is part of the human body, we are using it to mean help. So here, hand as in give me a hand is referring to give me help. So the hand used in helping is associated with helping. So here, it is not metonymy. It is not synecdoche, sorry, but not metonymy. We should know the difference. One will use something that is associated with it to represent it, and then one will use part of it to represent it. So we should take note. The next device we will talk about is paradox. Para that appears self-contradictory. Sometimes we hear it and we think it is silly. But when you consider it critically, then you know that, oh, okay, then this statement has some truth in it. So paradox is a statement that appears contradictory on the first hearing of it. But when you consider it critically, when you look at it very carefully, then you realize that it has some truth. For example, your enemy's friend is your enemy. Your enemy's friend is your enemy. Here, you have enemy. Enemy's friend is also your enemy. You just, what is enemy, what is friend? Then when you consider it critically, then you know that if somebody hates you and another person is the friend of that enemy of yours, then that friend can also be your enemy. Because there is the likelihood that your enemy is going to influence that person to hate you as well. So when you consider it very well, okay, then you realize that your enemy's friend is your enemy. Then the next one is, I must be cruel to be kind. I must be cruel to be kind. Here, the contradiction is cruel and then kind. This statement is said by Hamlet in William Shakespeare's Hamlet, the Prince of Denmark. Hamlet wanted to revenge the death of his father by killing his uncle Claudius, who married the mother Gertrude. But here, he was also warned not to hurt the mother. So as Hamlet was going close to Claudius' chamber, he said, I must be cruel to be kind, meaning he must be cruel to kill the uncle so that he will be kind to the dead father. So here, being cruel to the uncle means being kind to the mother. So when you look at the statement, how can you be cruel and then it will result in kindness? But when you look at it carefully, you realize that his cruelty will result in kindness to the dead father. The next one is ignorance is strength. How can being ignorant give you strength? Sometimes if you don't know something, it will not hurt you. So being ignorant about it gives you strength. For example, if you are not aware that there is a snake 
hiding somewhere in the room. You can easily go to the room, do everything, and then go away. But if you are aware that there is a snake lurking somewhere in the room, even passing by, you will be afraid. So here, we know that ignorance is strength. Now, we shouldn't confuse paradox with oxymoron. Paradox is to do with ideas, while oxymoron is to do with words. They all present self-contradictory things, but paradox will present ideas, and then oxymoron will present words. Let's look at this. Sweet memories. Here we are looking at bitter sweet being wet, but when we say that when we say that ignorance is strength, it is to do with the expression of ideas and not wet. It is the idea in this statement that is self-contradictory. But here, it is the idea in the two words placed side by side that is contradictory. So what oxymoron is to do with contradictory words, paradox is to do with contradictory ideas. So we should take note and not confuse the two. The next device is rhyme. Rhyme. What we must know is that rhyme is a sound device and most of the time rhyme is used in poetry. Rhyme is mostly found in poetry because it is a sound device. When we say two words rhyme or words rhyme, then it means that they have similar sound. Here we are exploiting sound and not autograph or the spelling. We are not looking at spelling, but we are looking at sound, sound, not the spelling. So let's look at the simple rhyme here. Ba, ba, black sheep. Have you any wool? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full. One for the master, one for the day, one for the little boy who lives down the lane. So here you realize that we have the word wool, fool, dame, and then lay. So we can hear wool, fool, wool, fool. It's the sound is similar, though they don't have the same spelling. If you use the spelling, you are going to get it wrong. But if you use the sound, then you will hear wool. Ooh. So you hear the sound ooh, ooh, and then we have day, lame. So you hear a, a. So we say that wool and fool rhyme, and then dame and lame also rhyme. We have different types of rhymes: internal rhyme and rhyme. We have enjambment. When we come to treating poetry into details, we will look at all these. But if you look at this, you realize that two rhymes, two rhymes. In literature, we call it couplet because they are two. So Baba Black Sheep uses the couplet rhyme. So we have wood, wood, then lay. So you, you can also come out with your own rhymes or the poems you know and try to find out some of the rhymes. The next device we will look at now is sarcasm. 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 When somebody is using this device, we say that the person is being sarcastic. When you use sarcasm, then you are being sarcastic. What is sarcasm? Sarcasm is when you state the direct opposite of what you want to say. 
to either mock the person or for amusement. So stating the direct opposite of what you want to say. So we can say that sarcasm is the use of irony for mockery or for amusement. For example, if we take uh, the Bible, Exodus chapter 14, verse 11, there is the use of sarcasm. When the Israelites were taken away from Egypt and they realized that the Egyptians were chasing them with their chariots, they got scared and even they were sarcastic. So they asked Moses, was there a lack of grace in Egypt that you took us away to die in the wilderness? So this is a sarcastic statement because there are so many graves in Egypt. If they should die in Egypt, they can be buried. But here they are asking Moses, is it that there are no graves that you're taking all of us here to come and die in this wilderness? So here he realized that he's stating the direct opposite just to insult Moses or to mock him that whatever he has done helping them to get away from Egypt has come to nothing. He hasn't done anything helping them to come to Egypt. Taking their present situation. The next one is, the student was so intelligent and smart that he even added his friend's name to the answers he copied. Let's take it that there is an examination and then somebody copies another friend the answers he had written and even added his name. Then the teacher says, the student was so intelligent and smart. Here, we realize that we are talking about the direct opposite of intelligent and then smartness. Because if you are intelligent, you will know that the person's name shouldn't be part of the answers. But if the teacher says the student was so intelligent and smart that he even added his friend's name to the answers, then the teacher is being sarcastic. So sometimes we use sarcasm when you are criticizing somebody or when you want to make fun of another person. The next device we will talk about is symbolism. Symbolism. When you use one thing to represent another, then we say you are making use of symbols. Sometimes we use the dove as a symbol for peace. So that's when some people have conflict or when there is a conflict and then the dove is introduced then you know that the dove here is a symbol for peace in Maya Angelou's caged bed those of us in form SHS 1 and 2 this poem is part of our set poems caged bed caged bed. This is the title of the poem. In that poem, the cage is a symbol. The cage is a symbol for confinement and then oppression. So, the cage here, as used in the poem, symbolizes confinement or oppression and then title itself caged bed represents a bed that is put in confinement so if the bed here is a symbol then it will also mean freedom freedom or the desire to be free. So, we have the bed symbolizing freedom 
with all their desire to be free. And then the caged is a symbolizing confinement or oppression. In The Vultures by Diop, David Diop's poem, The Vultures, he uses holy water. to symbolize Christianity. So he says, in those days when civilization kicked us in the face, when holy water slapped our cranking brows, especially those who are Catholics, when you go to church, they sprinkle water on you. So here, David Diop uses holy water to symbolize Christianity. And then in the poem itself, the title is The Vultures. Here, he uses the vultures to refer to the Europeans. So the vultures itself is symbolic, referring to the Europeans who, who according to him, came to exploit Africa. So we have holy water standing for Christianity in that poem, and then the vultures for Europeans in that poem. Again, in the bed and the cage is also used as symbols in the schoolboy. Those in form three, you are reading the schoolboy. That in that poem too, we have the bed and the cage symbolizing freedom and then oppression. Our next device will be image. The moment you hear imagery, what comes to mind? Image, picture, imagery. So when you hear imagery, what comes to mind? A picture or an image. Imagery is when you are called upon or you are made to visualize something in your mind's eye. You imagine seeing it when something is described. So by the use of certain descriptions, by the use of certain words by writers, you are made to imagine seeing whatever is described. In literature, we have five types of imagery and this imagery makes use of the five senses of our five senses how we experience things with our five sen senses is then used to exploit imagery so that we will have visual imagery that is to do with sight we will have auditory imagery that is to do with hearing we have olfactory imagery that is to do with smell gustatory imagery to do with taste and then tactile imagery to do with touch. Now, let's take each one of them and then look for examples. Visual imagery. For visual imagery, when things are described, you imagine seeing it. Sometimes you even want to open your eyes as the thing is read for you and then you want to see it well. But all these things happen in what we call the eye of the mind, in your mind's eye. So in your mind's eye, you imagine seeing whatever is described. Now let's look at the first one. It says, the starry night sky looks so beautiful that it's bad him to linger but he reluctantly left for home you see when you are reading this the starry night the night full of stars in the sky sometimes you even want to look up and check whether the stars are there because by the description you are made to imagine seeing the light so sometimes when you read the starry night looks so beautiful if you are not careful you will look up to check whether the starry night is there that it begged him to linger, but he reluctantly left for home. 
let's look at the second one it says it was dark and dim in the forest if you hear this statement you even try to open your eyes wide because you want to see through the dark and dim forest because of the way it is described dark itself is dark and then we have we've added dim to it so it says it was dark and dim in the forest the next one is a poem taken from William Wordsworth and it is called Daffodils. In that poem, he was walking lonely and then he came across some daffodils and he was describing them. He says, I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over hills and hills. And all at once, I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees. So here, he says, he saw a crowd, a host of what? Golden daffodils. So you realize that the crowd here is referring to the number the number of daffodils he is talking about because they are many. What's what says crowd of daffodils? And he also talks about them as a host. Normally referred to a number of angels as host, still referring to the number. And now he says the crowd or the host of daffodils. Now he comes to describe the appearance. It is golden. We know that for those to be yellow flower, but here it refers to its appearance as what? Golden. So you imagine seeing a lot of golden flowers. Some are beside the lake, others are beneath the trees. So you even look around to check whether the daffodils are there. It's because of the descriptions. We realize that in the descriptions, he uses other devices to create that visual image. For example, it says crowd. Here, he personifies the daffodils as if they're a group of people. And now he also personifies it by saying, he uses metaphor here, a host, as if the daffodils are angels. So you realize that other devices can come together to create imagery. We will go to the next type of imagery which is auditory auditory imagery this is to do with hearing when you hear the stone fell with a splash in the lake you would want to imagine how the splash will be this time you are imagining with your ear we are you are imagining with the hearing senses so that is to do with hearing we imagine the stone falling into the lake and making that sound. Now it says the sound of a drum in the distance attracted him. So you can even strain your ears to imagine hearing the drum at a distance. That attracted him. So you can imagine this when you are reading. The children were screaming and shouting in the fields. You imagine that they are disturbing you. Hey. So they are screaming and shouting. In all this, you imagine hearing whatever is described here. The next one we will talk about is olfactory image. Or factory image that is to do with the sense of smell before we continue you can call in and then ask questions or you can call in to contribute especially with the imagery you can call in to state the other devices that are used to create that image let's see if we can get the number to call is 020 seven five six six one eight five or you can call on zero five four three two nine one zero
0543291074. Now let's go back to our file tree image. That is to do with smell. For the first example, we have she smelled the scent of sweet hibiscus wafting through the air. Its tropical smell. A reminder that she was on vacation in a beautiful place. As you are reading this, you are even made to just stretch your nose to perceive the smell in the air. This is because of the way it is described that she smelled the scent of sweet hibiscus. If you are not careful, you even express it to yourself. Ah, because you are smelling the hibiscus yourself. You are imagining smelling it. Hello, we have a Hello. Hello, good morning. Good Hello. Morning. Yes, may I know your name and where you are calling from? Nanefua. Oh, okay. You are welcome, Nanefua. Do you have a question or a contribution? A question. A question. Okay, let's go. Hello, Nanefua. Let's have your question, please. Could you go back to the um, auditory imagery? Because uh, I'm finding a little problem. Which of the examples? The auditory imagery? The second one under Maya Angelou's cage bed. No, for Maya Angelou's cage bed, that is to do with symbolism, not auditory imagery. Yes, that one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You address it. Welcome. You're welcome. Okay, let's finish with offer three images. Then we'll go back to symbolism to explain for the left one. Offer three imagery is to do with smell. You are made to imagine smelling what is there or perceiving the smell of what is said. Now, we go to the second. The first one is a sweet smell, so you are even made to imagine smelling it. Then the second one says, there lay refuse heaps on their parts that were so smelly that it maddened them. There lay refuse heaps on their parts that were so smelly. Sometimes when you are reading this, even your facial expression will indicate what you are talking about, as if you can perceive the offensive smell yourself. There lay refuse heaps on their parts that were so smelly that it maddened them. As you are reading, your facial expression will even show as if you can perceive the smell. The next one, the beggar, aromatic with spices, made his mouth water in anticipation of the first bite. If you are not careful, you will go hungry reading the statement because you can imagine perceiving the aromatic spices in the bed. So you imagine smelling the spice, the aroma of the spice, and then just like the speaker talking about the person here, your mouth will also water. Now we will go to Gastetri imagery. When we talk of gastetri imagery, we are talking about imagery that makes you imagine tasting whatever is talking about. Here, we will still use that example. The burger, aromatic with spices, made his mouth water in anticipation of the first bite. Here, it is not the aroma of the spices, but the first bite. If you are reading this, you get so much into it that you might even lick your legs in anticipation that you will also take the bite of the burger. Now, the second one, it says, The candy melted in her mouth and swells of bitter sweet chocolate and slightly sweet but salty caramel. See, all these are tastes. So as you are reading, you might even be checking your tongue to see whether you can also taste it. 
blended together on her tongue. So as you are reading, you will be checking whether you can also taste the bitter sweet chocolate or the slightly sweet but salty caramel. You will also find out whether you can taste. Sometimes you even close your eyes and then, though you don't have anything in your mouth, you would imagine how the taste will be. The third one, Joe plucked an apple right from the tree and crunched into it. The tart juices filling his mouth and running down his chin. If you are not careful, you even wipe your chin yourself, though you are not Joe. Here you imagine how the juices will fill his mouth and then even drip. So here you imagine with your tongue, your sense of taste. Hello. Hello. Hello, good morning. Good morning. May I know your name and where you are calling from? My name is Deborah. Okay, you are welcome, Deborah. A question or a contribution? Deborah, a question or a contribution? Guys, thank you. Okay, then pay attention. I'll go over since we are still on gas station. Is that okay? Okay. When we say gas station, it is to do with taste. Right? So when we talk of an imagery that is gas station imagery, we are talking about an imagery where you imagine tasting it. In the first example, he says, the beggar, aromatic with spices. We are talking about beggar, beggar, food that is eaten. Here it has aromatic spices. Made his mouth water in anticipation of the first bite. So you yourself, as you are reading, you imagine how the beggar will be, how aromatic the spices will be, and then you yourself, you will imagine tasting the first bite. So that imagery, the way you imagine how the taste will be, is what we call the stage imagery. So you imagine, this time you are not imagining with your eyes, seeing it, but you are imagining tasting it. I believe Deborah, you understand now. Now to the second one, the candy, you know candy is to do with food tasting melted in her mouth if you've ever taken candy that melted in your mouth you can imagine and swells of bitter sweet chocolate so here you can even imagine how the bitter sweet chocolate will be this time you are not imagining hearing it you are not imagining seeing it but you are imagining tasting it hello we have a caller hello hello good morning Hello, I can hear you. Please lower the volume on your TV set so that we can hear you clearly. Hello. Yes, go on. Oh, your line is very faint. Please call back. Then number three says, Joe plucked an apple right from the tree and crunched into it. So he just bit into it. The tart juices filling his mouth and running down his chin. If you are reading this, you might even want to clear the juices from your own chin because you are imagining and then you have the feel of how the juices filling his mouth and running down his chin. So this gastatory imagery. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Yes, good morning. Oh, so sorry we've lost you. The next imagery is tactile imagery. Tactile imagery. Tactile imagery is to do with touch. 
or feel the way you feel. Hello? Hello? Hello, Kala? Hello? Okay. Tactile imagery is to do with touch Hello. or feel. Hello? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine. Okay. May I know where you are calling from? Please, I don't understand the image. I can't hear you very well. Hello? Hello. Yes. Your question. Okay, Joanna. Joanna, your question, please. I don't understand the image. Imagery. Okay. We said imagery is when you read something and then the description makes you imagine what is happening. Is that right, Joanna? Imagery is when you read something or something is presented to you. Most of the time, we are talking about descriptive pieces. Something is described in such a way that you yourself, you imagine how it should be. You imagine in your mind's eye. You imagine either seeing it, tasting it, feeling it, or hearing it. And as we perceive with our five senses, in literature, imagery is exploited using the five senses. Now we are talking about tactile imagery. Imagery that will make you imagine feeling what is talked about. For example, the old man took a handful of dust and sifted it through his hands. So he took the dust and then he sifted it. He was feeling the dust. So as you read this, you imagine yourself. Sometimes you can even close your eyes and then imagine sifting dust through your hands. So this is what we call tactile imagery. Sometimes even when you are reading, you have your book and you are reading, you would unconsciously see yourself doing whatever the person is doing because you are imagining, feeling it. The second one, the wild gust of cold wind pierced her body. You see, maybe the room is locked. Then all of a sudden, the door opens and then wind gusts in. If you are reading this, sometimes you are even made to hold yourself as if you can feel the cold touching her body. So the wild gust of cold wind pierces the body as if you can feel it. So here you are imagining how the cold wind will pierce the person's body. The next one, after the long run, after the long run, he collapsed in the grass with tired and burning muscles. Can you imagine how the burning muscles will be? After the long run, he collapsed in the grass with tired and burning muscles. The grass tickled his skin and the sweat cooled his brow. So after a long run, you are tired, then the person collapsed into the grass. As you are relaxing, you can feel, you, you even imagine the grass tickling the person's body and then cooling his brow. So here you realize that the descriptions will make you imagine how the whole thing is. This time you are not imagining seeing it as with visual imagery, but with tactile imagery, you are imagining how you feel. So you realize that other things will come together to create imagery. Other things will come together to create imagery. We will quickly go back to the cage bed for the one who asked about cage bed. Here we are talking about symbols. Symbols. Symbols when you use one thing to represent another. In the cage bed, if you have the poem, take it and read and you understand what you are talking about. In that poem, the cage is a symbol for oppression. 
So when you are put in a cage, the cage signifies that you are oppressed. When you are put in a cage, you are confined. You cannot move. You are limited. So here, the cage is a symbol for confinement and oppression. And the bed can be the symbol for freedom. I believe you understand. So we have come to the end of the lesson. You can ask questions on my personal number 0244545084. We are still asking for sponsorship so that we can bring on board more subjects. Thank you very much for making this lesson a success. We will meet same time next week. Bye.